I owe the country of Cuba a great deal. When I first started reading about politics and philosophy, when I was about 16 years old, I had a two-year or so limbo phase. For some reason, I couldn't exactly pick a particular political label or ideology that seemed to suit my preferences. Eventually, while chatting with a good friend, he mentioned the idea of libertarianism and explained some of its core ideas as we walked and chatted. I was kind of convinced. I looked into it some more just to be sure, and I watched some videos of Milton Friedman and Frederick Hayek. I found them compelling, but I was always wondering just how much this quasi-mythical free market brought millions out of poverty, all while promoting peace, cooperation, and cosmopolitanism. It sounded all a bit too idealistic for me, so I didn't yet commit to libertarianism. Later that summer, my parents announced their curiosity about Cuba and how they intended to visit it. I hopped on a plane to Cuba with my parents and sister, not really knowing much about Cuba or socialism. We touched down in Havana at Jose Marti International Airport, an unfamiliar yet imposing name. After hailing a cab, we drove to a hotel in the middle of the city. And as I started to look out the window, I realized that all the cars looked like they're from the 1950s. I didn't see any stores, or at least nothing that looked like a store. After dropping my bags off, we headed out into the streets to find some grub. Everyone was warm and friendly, laughing, chatting, and drinking while admiring the coastal view. It was apparent to me then that Cuba is a natural paradise, a gorgeous place. On the way home from that first night out with my dad, he explained to me that the state controlled the vast majority of the economy in Cuba. Private property and free enterprise, the institutions that Friedman and Hayek had praised so highly, were nowhere to be seen. Nearly everyone worked for the state. Their lives and work tightly regulated. Even though the law limits the use of markets, reality doesn't. Huge numbers of Cubans make their living by selling goods in the black market, or as it is known, the Bolsa Negra. Normally, black markets sound like they're for guns or drugs or something bad like that, but black markets in Cuba provide cell phones and homemade pizzas. Economists estimate that nearly everyone in Cuba is involved some way, shape, or form with the black market. At the time. My only real experience of socialism was through left-leaning friends, a few disparate YouTube videos, and a very half-hearted read of the Communist Manifesto. If I'm being honest, socialism promised so much in theory, but I was perplexed by socialism in practice. Curious, I decided to download Friedman's Capitalism and Freedom. This time, I was convinced of libertarianism. After my trip to Cuba, I became a firm libertarian. I had never appreciated how lucky I was to be born in a country like Ireland. Sometimes freedom is a bit like air; you only really think about it once you have none. Fast forward to today, seeing the protesters in Cuba stand up for the totalitarian regime they live under is so inspiring. It's so heartbreaking at the same time. To give some love to Cuba, I thought I would talk about one of their national heroes. No, not Fidel Castro. I'm talking about Jose Marti, the 19th-century Cuban philosopher, journalist, translator, professor, and above all else, a true patriot of Cuba. So much so. He's been dubbed the Apostle of Cuban Independence. Though Castro's regime adopted Jose Marti as a symbol of the revolution, Marti is definitely no communist. Jose Julian Marti Perez was born on January twenty eighth, eighteen fifty three, in Havana. His parents were Spanish. His father was from Valencia, and his mother hailing from the Canary Islands. At around the age of four, Marti and his family relocated to Valencia in Spain, but after a two year stint, returned to Cuba, where his father found work as a prison guard. Marti began his education, and from an early age, thrived at learning. Marti's parents were not educated, and were always on the brink of poverty. Because of his parents' economic situation, Marti worked from the tender age of nine years old to help support his family. Though young, he excelled as a clerk working in Western Cuba. Marti's father hoped that his budding intellect would help him have a secure career in a white-collar job. Marti was growing up when Cuba and Puerto Rico were the only Spanish colonies left in Latin America. By 1830. Peru, Argentina, Paraguay, Bolivia, Colombia, Venezuela, Chile, and Ecuador had all won their independence. Under Spanish rule, Cuba was a multiracial society, but slavery was rampant, with some estimates placing the slave population of one third of Cuba's total population. Mostly of African heritage, slaves had no legal rights. The vast majority were forced to work the numerous profitable sugar mills throughout Cuba for 17 hours a day. By 1860, Cuba was producing one third of the world's sugar supply. Making slave labor a lucrative investment for those with wealth. While still a boy, Marti's father brought him to the countryside for work. When the young Marti saw a slave ship unloading the brutalized survivors of the voyage, while making a separate pile for those who had died, what Marti saw shocked him to his core. 
but Marty did not falter. Though only a boy, he clenched his hand into a fist, vowing to right the moral wrong of slavery. Later, Marcy would comment that this was the beginning of his lifelong battle for equality and justice for the people of Cuba. Following the advice of his mother in 1865, Marcy was enrolled in Escuela de Instrucción Primera Superior Municipal de Varones, headed by the poet and journalist Rafael Maria de Mendive. Marti did not get along very well with his father, who was always loyal to the Spanish government. While his father believed he was educated enough and urged him to return to work, seeing Marti's potential, Mendive kept an eye out for him, and almost became a kind of surrogate father. Marti regularly came over to Mendive's home for meals and joked that he was part of the family. But besides companionship, Mendive helped nurture the young Marti's political conscience. Mendive advocated for the abolition of slavery and the independence of Cuba from Spanish rule. Mendive himself said his lifelong goal was furthering the advancement and improvement of society. Amongst the Spanish authorities' ranks, Mendive was speculated to be a dangerous traitor, ready to pounce. Of course, this made the young Marti only idolize him more. By 1868, the persistence of the slave trade, the silencing of the press, and sharp rises in taxes motivated Cubans enough to wage their first of three wars they fought against Spain. Marti was only 15 when the war broke out. Inspired by the example of his mentor, Marti joined political clubs supporting Cuban independence. He began writing his first political writings that vindicated Cuban revolutionaries. He even published his own newspaper, La Patria Libre, containing his story, Abdallah, about a fictional country struggling for freedom. Patria was a word that greatly resonated with Marti throughout his life. By patria, Marti did not mean just one's country or home, but a place they belonged to as a matter of deliberative choice. Though young, Marti was already establishing his future reputation as a passionate force of nature, as well as a deft commentator on political affairs. When Marti's mentor Mendive was arrested in 1869 by the Spanish authorities and trumped up charges, Marti took the helm of his school and helped support his family. But it wouldn't take long for Marti to follow in his mentor's footsteps. Marti was arrested alongside his friend Fermin Valdez Dominguez for the charge of possessing writings that supported the revolution. The evidence that the Spanish authorities produced was a singular letter Marti and Dominguez had written, criticizing their fellow student for joining the Spanish army. Worse yet, the letter the pair had written was not even sent or published. Based on this unpublished and unsent letter, Marti was charged with treason. At the tender age of 16, Marti was sentenced to jail in Havana. The poor conditions in prison led to Marti becoming ill, while also suffering from deep wounds that would permanently scar from the shackles placed on his legs. After four months of rotting in a cell, Marti confessed his so-called crimes and was sentenced to six years in prison. Originally, Marti was sentenced to death, but as he was so young, his sentence was changed to six years of hard labour. How merciful. After being transferred to a new prison to help his ailing health, the authorities decided to exile Marti from Cuba, forcing him to move to Spain. Marti was allowed to continue his studies in Spain. After all, Marti was a smart kid. Exile meant he could be away from Cuba, and while in Spain, he could train to be an asset to the Spanish. Hopefully this young rebel would renew his loyalty to Spain, and eventually become an asset. Though prison was hell, Marti wrote to his mother, it has given me plenty of lessons from my life, which I foresee will be short. After his release from prison, Marti always wore a ring forged from a link on the chain he had worn in prison. Inside of the ring was engraved the word, Cuba. In exile, Marti traveled to Madrid, instantly establishing himself with fellow Cuban exiles. Taking advantage of his situation, Marti enrolled as a member of independent studies at the Central University of Madrid. Applying his studies, Marti openly debated the validity of Cuban independence, while in the very midst of the colonial power he was fighting against. He also published articles in his time in prison, as well as tracts detailing Spain's brutal repression of the Cubans. Marti took every single chance he could to extol the cause of Cuban independence throughout his life. Marti was actually one of the first people to fly the Cuban flag in Spain from his apartment balcony in 1873, and that's patriotism. By May of 1873, Marti had relocated to Zaragoza to further his studies in law, all while publishing numerous articles on Cuba, as always. In 1874, Marti completed his studies with a degree in both civil and canon law. Though Marti loathed the government of Spain, he loved the people, as he could perceive the distinction between the state and civil society. While staying in the province of Aragon in quiet harmony, Marti came to admire the everyday honour and integrity of the Spanish, a stark contrast to the morally lax politicians of Spain at the time. 
Marty left Spain and travelled through France. While in Paris, he met Victor Hugo, the author of Les Miserables. Hugo and Marty were kind of like kindred spirits. Both of them had a great sympathy for the downtrodden and oppressed. Marty progressed to England and hopped on a steamship heading towards Mexico, where his family had relocated. In 1875, Marty began living in Mexico City. And as always, he quickly integrated himself into the local political scene, writing for various newspapers before joining the editorial staff of a paper, the Revista Universal, a broadsheet that covered politics, literature, and financial affairs. After a few years in Mexico, in 1877, Martí initiated this plan to relocate to Cuba alongside his family, under the cover of a fake name. But Martí quickly vacated Cuba and moved to Guatemala, where he lived amongst the intellectuals in Guatemala City. Impressed by his passion and intellect, Martí was appointed head of the Department of French, English, Italian and German Literature, History and Philosophy in the Universidad Nacional. In 1878, a pact was signed, ending the 10-year Cuban struggle for independence from the Spanish. Though not the outcome he had hoped for, there was a bright side for Martí. The pact granted a general amnesty for all political offences since 1868, meaning Martí could now finally return to his home after a nomadic exile. Upon his return to Cuba, Martí married Carmen Zayas Bazán in Havana. With extensive education, Martí confidently applied to practice law in Cuba, but was rebuffed by the authorities. With no other outlet, Martí began to seek out fellow supporters of independence again. When the Spanish government began to refuse to honour the promises they had outlined in their pact, the Cubans were left not only betrayed, but furious. Martí exclaimed boldly that Cuba belonged to the Cubans and that rights are to be taken, not requested, seized, not begged for. Discontented Cubans rioted and attacked a Spanish stronghold, triggering the beginning of what is called the Little War of Independence. The Spanish government reacted by massively restricting freedom of speech, the press and assembly. Because of Martí's obvious leanings towards the cause of independence, he was arrested and deported to Spain yet again. Martí would not return to Cuba for 16 years. After a few months in Spain again, Martí simply left without asking for anyone's permission. He stayed in France, then sailed for New York, where he arrived in 1880. And like every single other place he stayed, Martí quickly began pumping out articles on all sorts of topics, but always looping back around to the great cause of his life, the independence of Cuba. In 1881, Martí was offered a teaching position in Venezuela. A few months into his new job, Martí started a magazine named the Venezuelan Review. Though Martí did not say long after, he managed to get on the bad side of the Venezuelan president, Antonio Guzmán Blanco. Returned to New York, Martí joined General García's Cuban Revolutionary Committee, composed of Cuban exiles advocating for independence. Though Martí did not see eye to eye with his more militarily minded compatriots. Martí always feared that following a successful revolution, the victors were quite likely to establish a military dictatorship over Cuba. After witnessing firsthand the military dictatorships of Venezuela and Guatemala, Martí concluded that a government headed by force would ruin Cuba. Martí believed quite emphatically that the power enjoyed by republics should only be in the hands of civilians. Martí advised waiting to return to Cuba. Instead of fighting right now, rally support from exiled Cubans and raise the necessary funds. Bide your time. Over the next decade, Martí was an active participant in Spanish-American literary and intellectual circles. When not tirelessly advocating for Cuban independence, Martí lectured, undertook contract translations, taught at schools, and even actually helped found his own school in 1890, named The League, where white and black students stood alongside one another. Martí was a charismatic speaker, and one observer noted that someone who has not spoken intimately with Martí cannot know the fascinating power that human speech can hold. But this charisma did not really affect his wife Carmen as much, who did not share her husband's zeal for independence, something Marti would felt was a huge personal betrayal. His wife Carmen returned to Cuba in 1880 with her and Marti's son. He would never see them again. By 1892, Marti attended a reunion of immigration representatives of the Cuban community of Key West and began the arduous task of organizing the newly founded Revolutionary Party. Importantly, Martí inoculated the party with a system of democratic organization that placed the will of the people over military authority. Martí tirelessly gave speeches, wrote pamphlets, and had articles published in newspapers to raise political and financial support. He founded his own newspaper named Patria, supporting Cuban independence. After being chosen as a delegate of the Cuban Revolution Party, Martí traveled through Florida, DC, Philadelphia, Haiti, Dominican Republic, and Jamaica, visiting exiled Cubans and garnering valuable support. 
again in 1893, Reggie extensively travelled throughout the United States and Central America, visiting Cuban clubs, which gleefully received the budding national hero of Cuba. Throughout his speeches, he articulated his vision of Cuba as a constitutional republic that governs for the benefit of all people, regardless of religion, race, or class. In April 1894, Martí and General Máximo Gómez convened in New York and began their plan for a revolution. Their plan was to muster a small group of trained soldiers to infiltrate Cuba and start a popular uprising that would quickly overturn Spanish rule. Martí moved yet again to Monte Cristo in the Dominican Republic alongside Gómez to plan the upcoming revolution. The revolution began on the 24th of February 1895, and quickly after, Martí and Gómez published the Manifesto de Monte Cristo, which outlined the reasoning behind the revolution and the principles that informed its supporters. But when Martí arrived with his fellow freedom fighters, the masses did not come to their aid as planned. While trudging through the countryside on May 19, 1895, the Spanish army attacked Cuban forces. Those in command ordered Martí to the rear guard to keep him safe, as he had little training as a soldier, but was also an incredibly valuable asset to the revolution as a whole. But as Martí heard sounds of gunfire, he could not bear to listen to other men die for the cause he had vindicated for his whole life. Taking a horse, Martí galloped into battle, right into the Spanish line of fire, and was shot and killed, dying at the age of 42. Some accuse Martí of intentionally sacrificing himself, either as a way to ensure his legacy or as a martyrdom to inspire beleaguered revolutionaries. Today, José Martí is an unambiguous national hero in Cuba. His image has become ubiquitous, with numerous busts, paintings, and statues strewn throughout Cuba. And just in case you forgot who José Martí is, his name is on the one peso note, so you really can't miss him. When you fly into Havana today, you fly into José Martí Airport, and then if you do some sightseeing around Havana, you will surely find a central square named after Martí, alongside a plethora of other streets, parks, squares, and libraries all bearing his name. From what I have read, it kind of seems that despite dying in 1895, Cubans almost kind of view José Martí as an old relative to every person in Cuba. However, quite worryingly, José Martín's fame and prestige grew exponentially under the communist leader Fidel Castro's reign, an opponent to both liberalism and capitalism. Castro has consistently claimed Martí as inspiration for his communist revolution and subsequent drastic reforms. So now the question is, why is José Martí on the show? How could he possibly be a liberal hero if one of his biggest fans was an architect behind a one-party communist state that makes a mockery out of the word freedom? The answer is complicated. Martí did a lot with his life. He was a poet, a teacher, a journalist, a revolutionary, and now a national hero. When he died, Martí left behind 27 volumes of collected works filled with articles, essays, speeches, poetry, literary criticism, observations on American life. The list goes on. He only wrote a few books, but mostly small articles and essays and speeches and lectures, so it's kind of hard to piece together what he truly believes sometimes. With such a colossal corpus written in such an unsystematic way, it is at times hard to parse exactly what he was besides a very patriotic Cuban. Today there exist two José Martíes. One is held by the communists in Cuba, the other held by the Cuban exiles, unfortunately mirroring the life of their hero. Communists like Castro love to claim Martí as their own, but the evidence is scant for this. Martí wrote briefly about Marx in 1883, praising him for taking the side of the weak, but overall rejected Marx's theory of class conflict as divisive and ultimately fruitless. Marx, who also proposed a very material view of history, is completely at odds with Martí, who believed that ideas above all else were the driving force of history, writing that trenches made of ideas are worth more than trenches made of stone. No ship's prow can cleave a cloud of ideas. So despite writing 27 volumes of essays, outside of this one particular essay, Marti only mentions Marx a handful of times, all while they disagree on fundamental matters. So what exactly is Marti politically? This is a tough question, but I think we can find some answers when we take a look at three areas of Marti's thought. The value of freedom, anti-racism, and his views in the United States. In his collection of poetry entitled Versos Sencilios, Martí stated that slavery is the world's greatest crime. Traumatized by the brutal treatment of slaves, as well as the torture and imprisonment he suffered at a young age, Martí had a lot of time to contemplate the value of freedom. While in Europe, Martí studied the German philosopher Karl Christian Friedrich Krauss, an obscure name today, but a vital thinker in the Latin American tradition of philosophical thinking. 
From Krauss, Marti inherited a disdain for any form of authoritarian state. Marti always had a great sympathy and faith in ordinary people. They did not need to be led like cattle. Instead, they need to be let loose to figure out the world for themselves with their own conscience. Marti never lost faith in the inherent decency of mankind, and he wrote that man is organized and good, and in the end, he always saves himself. For Marti, liberty is the essence of life. Whatever is done without it is imperfect. For Marti, a life without freedom would be incomplete and possibly even inhuman. But how do we best protect freedom? Ideally, Marti believed that the state ought to be a democratic affair, with laws based upon natural law, supported by a written constitution and a separation of powers to stop influence accumulating to one individual. With an idealistic zeal, Marti adopted the political ideals of the Enlightenment and the French Revolution as the blueprint for how Cuba ought to be, equality, liberty and fraternity. Usually when I cover thinkers in the past, it's often only a matter of time before you uncover their often unsavory beliefs about other races. However, with Marti, there is no trace of bigotry. Marti loathed any form of racism, viewing it as both repugnant and antithetical to the health of democracy. Marti went so far as to argue that race was merely a category created to divide and oppress people. In his famous essay, My Race, Marti condemns all forms of racism, writing, everything that divides men Everything that sorts them, separates them, and categorizes them is a sin against humanity. Marti believed that for a peaceful society to exist, we all must recognize the rights of others. But if there are those of us who believe, on faulty grounds, that huge portions of people, based on race, ought not to be part of political life, then peace is unachievable. Marti explained that men have no special rights simply because they belong to one race or another. When you say men, you've already imbued them with all their rights. In some ways, we can say, Jose Marti was one of the earliest champions of a fully comprehensive anti-racist ideology. Above all, he believed that the revolution in Cuba ought to be won with white hands. By white hands, Marti did not mean the hands of white people, but instead using the word to describe and denote purity. Marti believed that racial prejudice, whatever forms it might take, has no place in a democracy. Lastly, Marti and America. Perplexingly, for Marti, America was both a danger to keep an eye on and a model to follow. America was a looming power looking to expand its influence. The issue of race in America deeply troubled Marti, who believed racism was thriving like an ugly weed, threatening the delicate state of democracy. Marti feared that if Cuba followed America's example of race relations, Cuba would remain hopelessly divided and never muster the strength to become a democratic republic. But America was not all bad by any means. Marti actually found much to admire. For example, Marti greatly admired how immigrants in America work so industriously when compared to Europeans. New York also impressed Marti and made him contemplate that if America becomes so wealthy so fast, then why couldn't Cuba? What Marti admired most about America was the value that Americans placed upon free speech. Marti was consistently amazed that Americans tolerated parties that openly called for the destruction of capitalism and suffered no government interference. Everyone was allowed to have their opinions and beliefs no one would come for them. Marti endorsed the familiar values of the Enlightenment, while also improving upon them by staunchly committing himself to anti-racism. While Marti justifiably feared America as a possible new colonial oppressor, he also greatly admired the American ethos of hard work and the fundamental value of free speech. Jose Marti could be considered some form of liberal in many ways, but I don't really want to put a label on such a complicated man. Marti never really gave simple answers. Instead, he continually challenged the conscience of his readers, urging them towards action to bring about a more just world. While some might call Marti a utopian or an idealist, Marti always firmly believed what mattered was not man as he was, but as he should be. I've only touched the very tip of the Jose Marti iceberg. His life and writings ooze a kind of passion that raises Marti to the level of almost a mythical figure. I have a little theory of why Castro promotes Jose Marti so much. I believe that the reason why Castro puts up so many statues and monuments dedicated to Jose Marti is an attempt to trick Cubans that the revolution is over. If there are statues of such revolutionary heroes everywhere, surely there's nothing left to rebel against. But sadly, this is mistaken. As brave Cubans have shown us, there is still much to rebel against. And there's still much work to be done by those who take up the legacy of Jose Marti today.
Thanks a mil for listening. I hope you enjoyed this podcast. And if you did, you can subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. Portraits of Liberty is written and hosted by me, Paul Meany, and produced by Landry Ayers. You can also visit libertarianism.org to find more shows like this. I hope to see you next time.